Hi everybody, it's Jim from Sprague Wood Turning. This week we're going to take these two resin blocks and combine them with some really cool looking gnarly maple to make an awesome hollow form. So the first order of business here is to cut these resin blocks into pieces that I can actually smash with a hammer. That's what I want to do with these resin blocks. That way it'll give us a more random look, uh, unlike the Who Wants Candy Bowl set that I did. And I just took, with that set, I just kind of did the, uh, the resin blocks and then inlaid it with some white resin. So this week, we're going to take the hammer to this and do a right proper job on it. So after I cut the pieces, uh, this is a piece of plate steel, and as you can see, I'm using a hammer here. Uh, just the inner part of, of a roll of tape is what I'm using to try and contain these pieces, so they're not, they, they ended up flying all over the shop anyway. But um, make sure if you're going to do this that you wear a shield, as you can see I'm wearing gloves. I did get pelt it with the odd piece, so you know if you had like a woodworking apron, it may not be a bad idea possibly even a long sleeve uh, shirt. But um, anyway, uh, I, I went at this pretty hard. Uh, it was surprising actually how much effort it took to break these pieces up. Uh, I should have realized that because it's resin that it wasn't going to be easy, but this is how I went about doing it. Well, I don't know. We'll have to see. Let's mix up some resin. This week we're going to be using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. Uh, this is You definitely want to use a deep cast epoxy for this project or projects like this. Uh, in the end, I believe I ended up using just a little bit over two liters. I wanted to tint the epoxy, so I'm just using some liquid pigment black pearl from designer epoxy just to give it a little bit of tint just be careful when you open your bottles of pigment there was a, a hard blob at the very top of this and then of course it wouldn't come out so i gave it a little squeeze and as you see it kind of shot over there so watch out for that unlike most of my projects i didn't mix the tint on this real strong i i, I wanted to you know, he wanted to be able to see through it, but I thought it was best to just give a little bit of tint. All right, I don't know if this is going to be enough or not. I'm hoping that those resin pieces aren't going to float. I've got my big rock and uh, plastic bucket just to hold down the wooden pieces. So let's see what we got. I think that's going to give us the perfect amount. That wood is going to absorb some of it. There, I'll throw that in the pressure pot and we'll see you guys in there in three days. Man, that was a lot of hammering. <laughs> well, it's been three days. Let's see if we can get this out. Well, that was easy. Hmm. Yeah, I kind of thought this might happen. All the fines kind of went to the bottom. We'll have to trim that away so it's not so, uh, so it's more even. This is resin from a previous pour that was already in the bucket. So hey, that's a good way to clean your bucket out. <laughs> So there's one center. Here I'm just using the cuts all sanding disc just to grind back any roughness on the top. Then you'll see me use a template on the very top of this and drill a small hole and get it on the lathe.
So again, that was a real-time clip. I try to leave as many of those in there just to give you a sense of how fast I'm turning, the lathe speed, and this kind of business. Uh, I believe we started off at 750, and I think I pretty much turned this whole thing at 750. Uh, we are using the Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. And at this point, I'm not exactly sure what's going to be top and bottom yet. I know that all those fines on the very bottom, I didn't really, I wasn't really feeling that or grooving out on it. So I whittled away a bunch of that till I got down to almost uh, the same sort of size pieces throughout the piece. Uh, it, to me, it just wouldn't have looked good. Um, anyway, that's, that's kind of the way my brain thought about it anyway. So once I get this thing around it and have a good look at it, then I'll figure out exactly what's going to be top and what's going to be bottom of our hollow form. So I've determined that this is going to be the bottom. Um, so what I'm doing is just, I didn't want to lose that center. That's, that was important to keep that center. So that's why you'll see me drill it again. And here's the hot melt glue method again with a Phillips screwdriver. And I just use that to line up on the very center. Not a super crucial thing, but if it goes back on the lathe, really that center should line up and you shouldn't have to do much truing up on the outside of the piece. Yeah, I just need to true up the uh, the waste block or the, the piece that's gonna be held in the chuck for hollowing. And um, yeah, I mean, that that's it. I mean, I try to be as accurate as I can. That way we're not taking away uh, size from the hollow form itself. Once I've got the size that I want, I just use a parting tool just to sharpen up any of the edges so that when it goes into chuck, it's not essentially wobbling around. Um, so here we are, it is mounted in the chuck now. And um, you know, Again, a struggle with trying to keep the resin off of the camera. So you're probably going to see some, some of it dangling from the camera throughout this video. Um, so a couple of videos ago, I asked people, you know, on these during these voiceovers, is there anything that you'd like to, to hear me talk about? And last week I talked about, you know, the kind of the business side of being a professional wood turner. This week I'll cover uh, woods, woods that I really like to to turn uh, woods that are easy to turn and woods that I think that maybe beginners should start with. So I'll start with the beginners. Um, until you're really competent in what you're doing and confident with you know your tool work, the way I look at it is you know get some poplar, some birch, soft maple, and turn it when it's green. That way you can work on your tool control and your skill. Uh, you, you certainly would, wouldn't want to stick a block of maple on there, a hard maple or cherry or or walnut, and um, just uh, I'll, I'll, you know butcher it up <laughs> because you know when we all start, it's it's never what I would say easy. There's a first look at our hollow form, and I was like, when I put this in there, I was eh, I don't know if this is going to work out, but you know the more that I started shaping this. I said, you know, this this might be one of the nicest pieces I've ever made. Very cool. So that's what I recommend for you beginner wood turners. Uh, soft hardwoods. Stay away from pine, spruce, fir, softwoods. Uh, forget it. Cedar, that's another one. Those woods tend to tear out, and I think that they may frustrate more wood, uh, beginner wood turners than anything. Uh, I typically will never use any softwoods um, in any of my business. So once you've kind of mastered tool control and working it on green wood, well, you know, the principles apply the same to hardwoods that, you know, are now dry. So you can, it's, it's just not as easy to turn, but the principles are the same. But I can see that where somebody can get really frustrated with trying to turn a difficult wood like rock maple, because rock maple is exactly as the name indicates, it's hard. It's a very hard wood to work with. Um, cherry is is a joy to kind of turn, uh, but it, but again, in my area, cherry is an expensive wood. But if you say live in the northern U.S., maybe cherry is a more readily available source. Then maybe that's something that you would want to practice on. But green woods really cut nicely, and it will allow you to work on your tool skill uh, and develop your skills from there before you start working with the more difficult hardwoods. 
We are all set up for hollowing. This is the one-way captive system. And it has a laser. I've got it set up pretty much on the very edge of this teardrop cutter. Got a laser, of course. And um, so what I'm going to do first is go in and just clean out the very bottom here. And then start working my way up the form. And then I'll adjust the laser so that we got about a half inch wall thickness. And that'll be it. She'll be uh, ready for sanding. Now the woods that I like to typically work with are cherry and walnut. Walnut, as far as I'm concerned, is the king of North American hardwoods. And again, in my area, I actually have to travel three hours south here to even you know, typically find any. So, you know, it's an expensive wood in my area. And so that's why I kind of look at if you're a beginner wood turner, you shouldn't use that wood just because of what it is. It's, it's an expensive wood and it's not readily available in a lot of areas. But with that said, over the years, I've used a lot of birch, white birch and yellow birch. Yellow birch is typically harder. I would say that it's probably closer to soft maple, but it's a little harder than that. So it's another wood that... You, you know, beginner wood turners should probably stay away from. But, you know, it's really going to depend on your area and what you can get your hands on. Uh, another wood that I really, of course, like to use is burl. And burl, if you're a beginner, stay away from burl. Burl is very, very difficult to cut and cut cleanly. So until you've got your skills mastered, you really should stay away from burl because, you know, First of all, you're going to pay a lot more money for burl than you are for mostly any other woods. But, you know, walnut, cherry, maple burl are typically the woods that I really like to have in my business because they're very popular with my customers, especially the burl. Uh, you've seen me combine a lot of resin with the burl pieces on this channel, and they are very, very popular. Uh, but until you've got your, your, your tool skills mastered, you really should stay away from it and get some experience under your belt too because it can be kind of sketchy uh, turning burl as well. All right, I've switched over to one of my bent bars. That way we can do up here and get my laser set at about that. Half inch, five eighths ish. So anyway, we'll clean this all out. Um, I might go a little bit thinner than this, but not much more. And then uh, hopefully we'll be able to do some sanding. Some of the most difficult woods that I've worked with personally is beech. <laughs> and I don't know what it is with beech. I cannot dry beech. Uh, very, if I turn 100 beech bowls, 70 of them are probably going to crack. And it's something that I've really struggled with over the years. And I know that beech is used extensively in a lot of parts of the world, especially in Europe for, for salad bowls. But for some reason, I just cannot dry it, even with the anchor seal and all the drying methods that I use and the experience I have, I've had a really, really hard time drying beach without having flaws in it. Uh, I do have a wood turner friend of mine and he actually steams his bowls and then lets them air dry. And he says that he swears up and down that that's the way that you know, it should do beach. So in the future, uh, next time I get a load of beach, I may try steaming it and just to see if I can really work with this wood. But, you know, for the life of me, I have a problem with it every single time I use it. Another wood that I have that's a real challenge for me sometimes is apple wood or really all of the fruit wood trees, uh, except for uh, cherry. The apple wood, it moves a ton when it when it dries. And that's the same thing with beech. I would say that beech and apple will move. And when I mean move, so I'm a twice turn turner. So I rough the bowls out and I put them in the shed and through my kilns to dry them. And then I return them and finish them. When they're drying, I, I would say that they move twice as much as uh, say, you know, like walnut or, or, or birch or anything like that. So I'm assuming that this is why I'm having so many issues with drying. 
I remember the first apple bowl that I was roughing out. Uh, I left it on the lathe. I just went in for a half hour to grab some lunch and I came back out and it was full of splits already. It had already started to dry and I was really shocked by this because, you know, I'd roughed out some other bowls prior to this and I never really ran into that issue. So, you know, Apple is one of those woods that you can dry it without flaws. Uh, you just got to be really patient with it. Uh, the apple and the beech, I would let them sit in my drying shed for six months to a year before I would put them through my fridge kiln. And that way, I was hoping that the majority of the moisture would be gone and there would be less movement as it dries in the kiln. So those are probably the two most difficult woods that I personally work with. Walnut can be on that level as well. Walnut is actually quite hard. And uh, the other issue with walnut is it can be quite aggressive on your lungs. And uh, so if you if you have breathing issues, you should probably stay away from, from walnut because it's, uh, it's quite an irritant at times. But uh, man, it's a beautiful wood. And I, I typically don't have too many issues with it, but I know that a lot, a lot of people do. So that's why it's always important to wear a self-powered respirator when you're when you're working with these woods especially when you're sanding them um, i understand that a lot of people don't like to wear a self-powered respirator or a respirator period but i really do recommend wearing one the whole time that you're turning because you only got you know a set of lungs so it's the only set you got so you got to protect them so those are the woods that i like to work with and the woods that i recommend beginners work with uh, if by all means, if you turn beach on a regular basis and you're successful in drying it, I would love to hear your, your drying methods so that I can give them a shot. Uh, spalted beach, some, I've seen some absolute spectacular pieces of spalted beach, and I've had some myself as well. So, you know, it, it's a great wood to work with, uh, but man, I just have a ton of issues trying to dry it. So love to hear your methods if you're successful at it. So getting back to the hollow form, we're getting pretty much to the wall thickness that I want. And, you know, typically I leave these pieces at no less than an inch thick. And, you know, you've got a lot of resin pieces combining here in the wood. So you need to be able to have some thickness there to hold those pieces so you don't have um, issues in the future. And there's the laser on the outside, and as soon as that laser gets elongated on the outside of the form or it drops off the form, then you know that you've got your wall thickness that you need it. I often will hear from people saying, you know, you should have made that piece thinner, but I'm always worried about pieces delaminating from the resin. So, you know, you really should give yourself a minimum half inch of thickness to hold all those pieces in place. Even though the majority of this is resin, I don't think that that will ever happen here. It there's always a possibility. All right, well, here's where we're at. See if I can give you a look in here. Uh, you know, I'm relatively happy with that. You can see some little bubbles and voids down there, but you know, it's not too bad. And here's the flashlight from the outside. Again, you know, if you like color, this is certainly gonna be up your alley. Very, very neat. But all I can give you is, so what I'm going to do, I'm not even going to bother sanding the inside of that. Uh, this opening's kind of small. So what we're going to do is trim the outside of this. I want to give this a little bit more angle here. Uh, we'll trim the whole piece outside, fill any voids, if there's any voids with some CA glue. We'll sand it, buff it, and I'm going to put a resin finish on the inside, and then we will put to finish on the outside of the piece tomorrow. Now that we're done with hollowing, I'm just gonna true up the opening on this because I plan on using the cone on my live center to support this piece. That way it doesn't uh, go flying across the shop if there's an issue. And I'm just gonna be using the Phoenix here just to try and clean up. I wanna leave a little um, collar on the very top. So that's what I'm doing here with the Phoenix.
you may or may not have noticed, I do kind of do things a little different than a lot of wood turners. Uh, a lot of wood turners may have sanded and finished the outside of this piece and then done the inside. Uh, the way I look at that is, you know, if in all likelihood, if this piece is going to come off the lathe, it's going to be during hollowing. So why waste your time finishing the outside of a piece when you don't know if it's going to survive? So I will typically always do the inside. I, I will certainly do the rough out, out profile, outside profile, and then I will move um, to the inside, finish that, and then come back and then finish the outside profile. Here I'm just using a little bit of Starbond Thin to fill in any little holes that there were. Uh, for the most part, there was pretty much hardly any voids in this. Again, uh, that's that's designer epoxy, that's deep cast, nice thin consistency, and it will get into all these little areas so you don't have to um, deal with a whole lot of filling of bubbles. Now I've got a freshly sharpened gouge here and I'm going to do some shear, uh, shear scraping on the outside of this piece. That's why I'm that's why I'm showing you the gouge. So it's freshly sharpened so I got a really nice sharp edge and I'm just going to go around the outside of this piece, clean up any of that excess C CA glue prior to uh, doing any sanding. And you can see a noticeable difference in the surface of the of the form compared to where it was with the Hercules and the gouge. You can do this with the Hercules as well, but I do find that the long swept back wings um, on this gouge really do an awesome job doing that. So you know, I will I will stick with that as far as doing the outside of forms. But, you know, to me, the Hercules is just an indispensable tool. And I'm, I'm so glad that uh, Mike has stepped forward and, and wanted to sponsor my channel. And same thing for you guys. You know, there's there's a discount code in the description down below if you want to get some Hunter tools. And uh, highly recommend them. Awesome product. Finally, on to sanding. So what I did here, this piece is typical of all my resin pieces. I sand it from 60 to 800. As I said earlier in the video, I never did any sanding on the inside. This is actually one of the cleanest hollow forms I've done to date on the channel. So um, once once we get done here, and again, these dimple discs, that allows you to work in that area and kind of wrap around that little collar so that to avoid any of the hand sanding. I still have to do a little bit of hand sanding, but not as much as it would have been with just a normal round sanding disc. But I couldn't get it in the opening like that. That that you definitely would have to do by hand because the um, the discs are too large for that. So once you've got that profile that you can use these uh, sanding discs, these dimple discs, you're golden. You got it made. Um, so yeah, just carried on to 800, sand it the piece out, and then the last thing before um, putting on denatured alcohol to clean it is to use the Tripoli buffing compound from the be all buffing system. And in the description down below, there is a link to Lee Valley where I buy these. And of course, like I said, the last step is just to use some denatured alcohol to clean away any of that buffing compound because you don't want any of that on the surface of your piece prior to finishing. All right, what do you think? Let me know. Let me know down in the comments. Uh, it is. It's colorful. So, this is going to be one of those pieces where you're really going to hate it or you're really going to like it. Uh, pieces of wood. They're kind of neat looking in there. All right. So anyway, like I said, we are going to use a resin finish on the inside, and that's what this is. This is a little bit of art cast from Designer Epoxy. So I'm just going to dump this in here. And we'll swish it around, make sure everything gets coated, and then I'll put it upside down in this little dish. And I'll let that kind of sit there for probably 10 minutes or so. Then I'll wipe it off, and uh, we will do the first coat finish on the outside tomorrow. I'm just going to fire up the torch here and just put it down inside and hopefully we we'll get rid of any bubbles. Yeah. 
So there, I'll leave that for 10 minutes, and then we'll see you guys tomorrow for the outside coat. All right, so for this week's project, we are going to be using the Gloss Waterlocks Original again. There's the can, in case you're curious what it looks like. Now this is probably going to take two coats, but we'll see. Uh, the wood's got a lot of resin in it, so we might get away with just one. Well, I knew it was going to be colorful, but wow, <laughs> that's crazy. Very, very cool. I can see more of these in my future. Just the total random randomness of where the pieces are and the little pieces of wood here and there throughout the piece, the clarity of it. Um, down inside, that resin has been cured now, nice and shiny. Very beautiful piece. I'll make a decision tomorrow if they're going to put another coat on it. I might just for the wood, but you know, really could probably get away with just one. Anyway, we'll see you tomorrow. Same process as before, before I put on any, before I put on the next coat of finish, I use the Triple E buffing compound. Kind of flatten out any lumps and bumps if there's anything stuck in the last coat of finish. And then use the denatured alcohol to clean the surface and then put on the next coat of finish. Well, good morning. This is the second coat of Waterlux Original Gloss. Well, there you go. That will definitely do it for this piece. That's for sure. Uh, the more I work with this piece, the more it's grown on me. I think it's a very cool, very cool thing. Uh, pieces of wood coming up through the top of it. Little pieces around the rim. Uh, it's see-through in a lot of the places. Um, really like this. It's kind of sharp. Uh, there's more translucent spots in some areas and some areas has got lots of really real color like that place look at that very neat all right so um, that'll be it for sure we'll see you tomorrow for the bottom so this is the next day and i've got the piece now on the vacuum chuck and uh, i know that somebody asked me to do another uh, talk about the vacuum chuck i'll have to save that for another video but here I'm just kind of whittling away the waste block that we put on the bottom of this. And again, this hot melt glue method works fantastic for me. And uh, again, I, re I recommend that people give this a try. That way you're not taking away any size from your piece. Because if I didn't have the waste block on the bottom of it, I would have had to have turned a tenon to hold it. And as a general rule, the, the resin, if it's an all resin tenon, doesn't seem to hold as nicely as, as a wood one does. So that's kind of why I've gone in that direction. And I've also made the uh, a little recess here, a mortise, if you will, on the bottom of this piece. So it's almost a, a true foot, if you will. Now I sanded this piece only to 500 on the bottom. I wasn't exactly sure what I was gonna do as far as putting my signature on there or if I was gonna use the engraver. In the end, I decided to use the engraver and I'm actually, I'm probably gonna be doing a lot more of this in the future. Uh, I didn't really see the point of going any higher than 500 and if you polish it and you're trying to write on it with a pen, it's really, really hard to do so. so what I decided to do was use the engraver, put it back on the lathe, and then just sand uh, the bottom because it tends to lift up a little bit. And then, of course, put a nice little coat of finish on the very bottom. And this piece will be done. All right, so that's it for the video. Let's do a last little chat about this week's project. A uh, really fun piece to do. Certainly a good way to recycle some resin if you do a lot of resin pours. 
Now here's the very bottom. It still needs one more coat of finish on it and then it will be done if I get the camera to focus here. Anyway, one more coat of finish on the bottom and it will be ready to go to its new home. And by the way, this piece is for sale. If you are curious, um, send me an email to spraguewoodturning at gmail.com and I will disclose, disclose the price there. Uh, the reason why I don't want to do that on here is, is in case this is a gift. So that's why I don't want to really tell people that how much this is worth, but it's on the higher scale. I will, I will say that. Um, fun project to do. Maple, resin chunks, uh, for the longest time, you know, you, you see a lot of wood turners on here kind of taking all these, these leftover pours and then making eggs with it and that kind of stuff, and that, that's fine. Um, I just was looking to maybe be a little bit more creative with it, so that's kind of where the smashed up resin <laughs> idea comes from. And, you know, there's, there's some places where, you know, there's some voids, clear voids through it, and, you know, it's just a lot going on, including the maple branches. So at the end of the video, I will put up some rotating pictures with it lit from above. And um, it actually looks really neat uh, if you get a light source inside of it. This, of course, would look nice with a big, tall finial on it as well. And we'll see more of that in, in the future. But for now, I just, you know, this piece is pretty busy as it is. So that's kind of why I didn't really go in that direction. All right, well, that's it. I should mention this is six and a quarter across and five and a half inches tall, and it's a beautiful little form. All right, well, let me know in the comments what you think about this week's project. And of course, that's where we're gonna get the next winner of the 65,000 subscriber giveaway bowl. We're gonna pick from the comments. So please leave a comment down below. And that thumbs up certainly helps the channel as well. All right, so I don't know what we're gonna do next week. Uh, I haven't really given it a lot of thought. I've got some family in right now, so that's kind of my primary focus, but uh, I certainly will be back next Friday with some something awesome. So please come on back. All right, well, that's it. Take care, stay safe. Don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. See you next week.